Welcome everyone to the virtual conference by Entrepreneur India under our uh, resilience series. Here we talk to business stakeholders who are striving to find out ways to fight the COVID pandemic and the future ahead. I am Saurav Kumar, Editor Special Projects Entrepreneur India, your moderator for the session. Well, the COVID-19 crisis has wrecked all economies across the globe. The most advanced nations and businesses have not been spared. And as an extended lockdown due to the coronavirus outbreak has kept people and businesses from resuming regular activity and the relaxation has been partial. Uh, there has been a reverse flow of migrant laborers to their native places. Well, while the government has announced many schemes to support the income of these laborers, such as allocating additional funds under the MG Narega scheme, these laborers are likely to fall back on uh, uh, agriculture. So these interrelated events are likely to put pressure on the country's farmlands. That's what I believe. Now, this crisis, uh, while being a deterrent to many businesses, has turned the focus on the agricultural infrastructure of the country, including the, that of the government. And, you know, here is where the agri-tech players have an important role to play. So uh, before we start the uh, session today, uh, I'll just uh, lay the ground rules for our attendees today. Uh, the panel session uh, uh, will go on for 45 minutes, and that will be followed by a Q&A session for the next 15 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can post them through the Q&A option. Our Facebook audience can post their questions uh, in the comment section. We'll take up the questions post the panel discussion. Let me now introduce and welcome the fantastic panel for the day. I have with me today, Mr. Karthik Jayaraman, co-founder and CEO, Vekul. Mr. Kunal Prashar, co-founder and COO, Crop In. Mr. Milan Sharma, co-founder and CEO, Intello Labs. Mr. Prasanna Rao, Managing Director, Arya Collateral Warehousing. And Mr. Sandeep Singhal, co-founder and managing, managing director, Nexus Venture Partners. So gentlemen, uh, just to, uh, you know, st uh, to start with the first question, uh, as I mentioned uh, in, my, uh, in my opening remarks that, you know, a lot of laborers have gone back. And, uh, you know, the first place, of course, uh, the government has allocated uh, additional funds for, uh, for, from, uh, for uh, MG Narega, and there are other schemes. But they are going to fall back on agriculture, at least for now. So I'm sure that this opens up a lot of opportunity for uh, uh, both uh, you know, the farmers and also the stakeholders around it. So to just start with, I will, I will want to know from uh, Prasanna, if I can start with you, that you know, what kind of opportunities really this kind of a situation opens up for agri-tech players? Um. You know, I think um, uh, going back to your point of having, uh, you know, a, a lot of migrants going back to their villages, my thought is that, you know, it, uh, it, it opens up challenges as well as opportunities. Challenges, certainly we know, you know, a lot of pressure on agriculture and the others, but opportunities in terms of uh, how do we use this strength for the for the benefit of the operations which are going on at the ground level. For example, in our work in the post-harvest side, specifically in smaller agriculture markets, over the last two months, we've seen many warehouses, uh, uh, many markets uh, not being able to operate because of lack of labor. Now, these are smaller markets, which also have been a source of agricultural labor and people are coming back to some of these markets. Now, is there a way in which this could be matched and some of these strengths that these uh, 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 returning migrants could bring in could be used in these circumstances? The other thing that we've seen is, is there is a mushrooming of farmer producer organizations across the country, I mean, both government induced as well as need based. Now, they have had a shortage of skilled manpower at different levels, including labor to quality assessment to a lot of other things, which is where we see. And in, it, in one of the studies that we ourselves have done, we've seen that there are FPOs who are trying to dip into that available talent 
uh, to, to make sure that their operations are further streamlined. Now, apart from this, one other thing that I feel what Agritech could do and can certainly do in this circumstance is that if there is a larger need for formalization of the distributed agriculture value chains, and that is what COVID has really thrown open uh, to the whole world. And, and that, is, that is where the, you know, the, the, the whole point has been that you, uh, yeah, so that is where the whole point has been that as agri-tech players, you try and formalize the whole uh, value chain. And uh, 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 whether it is in terms of visibility of different transactions, if you type that up with the, with the relaxations and regulations that is, that is coming up, there's a huge difference that agri-techs could make. Similarly, the other piece that we feel is that there are agri-techs doing different parts of these activities across the value chain. I see a huge potential of agri-techs working together. Somebody working on the pre-harvest side, tying up with the post-harvest player that connects to the markets. Somebody like Intello that really brings in transparency on quality, being tied up with a market platform, with a financing platform, so that the whole process could be further streamlined. So me, it's, it opens up a huge opportunity for individual startups to work standalone, but also to see how we could all work together to build that whole formalization through the chain. I think that's, that's where the greatest opportunity lies. Yes, of course. Uh, Milan, if I can come to you, uh, uh, you know, Prasanna mentioned that, you know, uh, formalization and, you know, different, uh, uh, like something what we call is a farm to fork sort of, you know, if, if people can come together and give solutions, is that, is that what, what you also think is the opportunity right now that comes up comes now? Right. So uh, let's first understand uh, uh, what crisis is giving to what opportunity, right? Uh, I'll just touch upon the crisis and then address uh, uh, what opportunity it is giving. Uh, it was one of the stress tests of the supply chain in the last two months uh, uh, from figuring out how seamlessly produce can travel uh, from farm to folk. And there are, as you also pointed out, there were challenges where certain processes which were labor heavy and uh, in order of shortage of labor, uh, there's a pressure uh, and the innovative ways to make them transparent. That is what. Second, the discovery of produce uh, is also being to an extent going towards a direction where digitally discovery of produce can be made. Uh, and it's important to understand because earlier and the current system was more physical in nature. Now, since uh, limited movement was there, the discovery of digital, digital discovery of produce, uh, it gave a push to that. And now coming, addressing to the question, this crisis gave a very, uh, path, very good path to the opportunity, which is a automating the process across the supply chain and also connecting different dots. Like uh, Prasanna also said, there is a very good opportunity for different players who were probably working in isolation and now uh, 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 in a very agile way, figuring out how can they address the problems and the crisis uh, in a more collaborative way. So this is giving uh, uh, at, a, at a very good pace, a very uh, good direction for automation and digital uh, trade to enable farm to folk in a more effective way. Okay. So uh, Sachi, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you straight, uh, straight away. So, you know, we, we just heard uh, uh, Prasanna and Milan saying that, uh, you know, uh, collaboration is the way that 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 is uh, that 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 can uh, you know really reap the benefits of the opportunities, and we have seen in some other uh, verticals like you know in education, like education and gaming, some of the players are coming together to offer newer products, or at least are talking to that. So, do you do you think that this is the time when uh, agitech players who are in one certain uh, play should connect with the other and will that be the value proposition that you see in uh, architect players now? Uh, this is for me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, from uh, what we are seeing uh, broadly across the ecosystem, there is more collaboration that is happening on the agri-tech side. I don't know if it is 
planned it is uh, happening i think organically because the underlying customers are effectively the same so if you look at uh, you know what prasanna mentioned and what uh, milan also mentioned prasanna is a you know is a warehousing solution is a logistic solution and so on milan is not going to provide the trucks prasanna is going to provide the trucks prasanna is the one who is the procurement person in the mandi but milan's technology in terms of quality and assaying is what will be used to make this more seamless right so i think by default you'll see the two of them working together to drive drive change and the there is there is obviously stress in the market right now you know processors have struggled over the last 2 3 years we've seen bankruptcies on the processing side and so on but broadly uh, there is you know the the farmer is still producing the the crop rabi crop is supposed to have been very good uh, i think prasanna made the point that it has been challenging in the mandis because of labor to have the offtake so whatever can be done to reduce that friction is going to be a, uh, is, is something that we are actually seeing across the board so from a investor perspective what you you know what you mentioned about uh, other industries so i think there's a broader trend that i would sort of want to outline here and that has to do with digitization so you know what covid has done in some ways is this uh, you know in the in the white collar side you obviously have this work from home concept obviously that work from home concept can't be taken to agri right. agri is fundamentally a physical uh, is a physical process so in that scenario uh, the the shift is really the digitization shift there is much more availability of information today uh, and the number of companies that we see that are working on agri extension that are working with farmers has gone up significantly and uh, on the other hand on the procurement side there is a, a significant requirement for the procurers to connect with the farmers you know it 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 improves their ability to do just in time procurement it reduces their working capital needs and so on so what you know karthik may be doing or kunal is doing with cropin so one of our portfolio companies uh, sumanthar is actually a client of cropin and we are working with over 150000 farmers using their platform and it has made a huge difference in our ability to keep track of what the farmer is producing when to when to procure and so on <clears throat> so i think there is so there is there is collaboration happening just because more and more tools are becoming available mm -hmm. okay 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 so uh, karthik i'll come to you and uh, then to kunal so now that we've heard that uh, you know collaboration is happening and uh, you know uh, so i'll go back to my first question to uh, uh, and ask you that you know for you uh who is uh, making the food available the the produce available to the uh, consumer so how do you see this opportunity where uh, you know a lot of relaxation has come in and uh, uh, the whole focus of the uh, uh, you know the government is also uh, is towards agriculture because we realize that uh, you know uh, in fact i'll just give you an example that uh, yesterday mahindra sales came, came in and uh, uh, So uh, you know their domestic sales are at par with what it was in May last year for this May tractor sales domestic it's not exports it's the, the domestic sales so you know it shows that there is need there and there is opportunity lying there absolutely I think uh, what uh, COVID served as a trigger for a set of reforms which uh, while we are waiting for the final text to be out. which if executed uh, uh, you know uh, as well as it was described there are at least three major opportunities that come out with three different opportunity horizons the first of course is the creation of multiple supply chain options for the farmer to liquidate their produce uh, here the most efficient player will win today apmc can be treated as a block it's a block which uh, handles the produce and a product in a certain way there will be multiple other such parallel uh, players coming in the only difference is now there is a level playing field so the best operator will win we we'd like to believe that the agri tech players will be the best operators the apmc uh, supply chain may believe otherwise we'll figure out who wins there are a few characteristics that sandeep described which are uh, critical over here i think there will be some amount of digital interfacing this is a digital business there will be a digital interfacing but a physical logistics backbone to it right. so the efficiency will be determined by the smoothest way to engage with the farmers as well as the best transportation problem solver 
the guys who have figured out the entire logistics uh, most you know uh, efficiently what i mean by smoothest interfaces you know we 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 all like apps we build a lot of apps but frankly in the last two months most of our business has happened on whatsapp and sometimes on twitter so that is the interface that I, that the farmers have found easy to understand and therefore you know we've got to learn that you know the uh, uh, build to build such interfaces and of course logistics how well you handle your trucking networks makes a very big difference this is horizon 1 Horizon 2 is even more interesting and it connects back to the point that you made about people going back to the villages. One must remember that these folks are skilled as well because they've been working in factories elsewhere and so on. There's an opening that's created by some of the new uh, benefits that are provided for village level entrepreneurs. The simplest thing is storage, post harvest uh-huh. storage. Uh, more and more people are realizing that uh, micro storage makes sense. Informally this already already happens for products like onion and garlic. these will get formalized maybe for other crops as well the next is value addition for example we are doing a small project where we are actually getting village level entrepreneurs to convert raw tamarind to processed tamarind so a lot of this value addition can shift to the villages and we move the finished product which is more efficient again so this we see as a horizon to development it's horizon to because the necessary ecosystem will take some time to build the third is actually uh, triggered by the contract farming law the challenge in india is we don't have consolidated buyers at that level uh, that exists in the west but we believe that over time consolidated buying perhaps for exports will emerge that will in turn trigger a whole host of services which are contract farming services which an agri tech player can do which will go all the way to agri extension for example into with in partnership with cropin quality control in partnership with intelo the supply chain orchestration by people like us and feed into large global buyers we believe that this ecosystem will come up uh, in horizon 3 so we see three waves of potential uh, transformation that's uh, that could uh, you know benefit the agricultural supply chain mm-hmm. thank you karthik sure that uh, i'm sure that that things up and kunal if i can come to you and have your views on on the same uh, thing that you know that what are the opportunities that it opens up uh, in terms of architecture especially now that uh, you know we heard uh, others also saying that you know there is collaboration going to happen Uh, silos are going to be broken down and other kind of uh, efficiency is the key where people who are efficient will be the one who will be the winners so what's your thought on that yeah so i think uh, it's it's a wonderful question to start off with uh, first of all like you no know, uh, the entire covid period we have seen the 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 real need of of going digital right uh, the entire uh infrastructure which was like you no know, which was carrying the information within themselves like the, the extension field officers the agents the the the, the supply chain uh, aggregators and all of them are have vanished which means now the the value chain players which are the businesses interacting directly with the uh, these players uh, are are not having information about what is happening in the ground level and that has resulted into massive losses at the at the field itself uh, during the particular rabi season so i think that has led to a lot of intervention a lot of a uh, lot of understanding from the government that these technology a digital framework of knowing what is growing where it is growing who is the farmer it's is very very critical for them uh, once you know that asset of the farmer that you know where is what is happening then all of the value chains can come and uh, and interact on that uh, a, a bank can come and finance a particular farmer because he knows that what crop is growing and insurance can come and and he can insure that particular crop you can have then input suppliers directly coming and there are so many startups doing that and we as i said like you know in the last discussions uh, everyone spoke about partnerships so while we bring in the complete uh, uh, solution from farm till the fork we always bring in partners who can then service those things at the right times then you have implement companies which can then come and service because laborers uh, obviously when labor is migrating from one part of the country there is a shortage of labor in the other developed part like punjab there is a there is a shortage of labor whereas in bihar and up and uh, bihar and up we have excess of labor right so where there is a shortage of labor we'll we'll see a challenge that implements uh, tractors and other things will be have to be utilized so i think there is a mass mass uh, shift that is happening and it has to be counterbalanced uh, so from where the labor is moving out there will be you will see a lot of technologies which will uh, be more about automation digital uh, but the challenge also will be in terms of where the labor is moving like and these are places where you have small holder farmers right the size of the farmers are not very very large and that's where you will you will see the models of aggregation coming out there like you no know, farmer producer organizations or groups sgs coming together and the advantage is that the labors that we are talking about is uh, as mentioned earlier is very skilled labors right uh, my personal 
views could be that they can be they can be very positively utilized they can become agropreneurs right uh, for institutions to come and directly engage at the rural level we need these people to come and and, and share the information and transact so they can be created as agropreneurs in that portal model they can be used to you know for all of the expertise that they have they can build their own infrastructures right for storage for processing for primary value addition at the at the field level so that the 10 to 20 percent which they normally do not uh, earn in that particular scenario can be earned at the at their own farm levels uh, the third is like you know, a lot of startups can think about like you know, sharing model co-sharing models like like say in parts of punjab when labor is not available and uh, you would need labor then they could be newer in models of of co-sharing of labor platforms like you no know, someone can say that you no know, hey this is the pool of labor which is available and for you to come and access that so and that will become a great asset for someone to come and and utilize so uh, i think uh, in all of these six things aspects that we talk about uh, digital enablement will play a very very strong role and uh, for us having promoting them for the last 10 years we see a great uh, opportunity uh, for all participants to come and and see where digital can play a stronger role for them uh, from the farming side pre plant uh, pre sowing during the production and post production everywhere we can link all of the stakeholders on a digital platform and i very well second everyone's thought that it doesn't work that you only bring your own solution and the problem is solved because agrarian problem is a very big one it requires a lot of partnership cohesion all together so that the end outcome can be the biggest value addition for uh, the stakeholder and what we believe is the pie is at the farm level uh, if you do not increase the per acre value uh, whatever you do at the top the pie is not large, large so you can you cannot increase the efficiency there so it's always great that we can collaborate to increase the per acre value and then uh, all of the stakeholders will benefit from there yeah. definitely that's a very interesting thought that you know shared shared resources shared economy is we, we have seen everywhere in the low hanging fruits of uh, travel mobility but in the farming definitely something we have not seen and also uh, the per capita and uh, per uh, the acreage that you mentioned and apart from that the per capita output from india is quite low compared with uh, 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 you know us uh, sorry even for that matter russia or other uh, countries so we have we already have some questions coming in so as we go along i will i will take uh, some of them so uh, one of our uh, uh, facebook uh, uh, audience uh, rushab jain he has a question do you think the cold storage setup could help curbing the transportation crisis shortly affecting so milan i'll come to you i have this, i had this question in my mind that you know in this uh, you know we have seen that a lot of food grain and everything gets wasted due to storage uh, you know in, in lack of storage infrastructure uh, across the country especially in uh, you know backward areas maybe punjab is more efficient in doing that but maybe a bihar or a jharkhand is not so so how do you see this uh, space uh, you know emerging and also given that now that the 1 lakh 1 uh, lakh crore uh, rupees is on infrastructure of agriculture would you want a substantial amount of uh, this money to go towards uh, storage facilities right so uh, uh uh so if you see uh to complete food wastage uh, globally uh, is around uh, 30 to 35 percent and for a country like us uh, so there's a term called loss and wastage wastage is when uh some from retail and consumer they don't eat and but buy and loss is due to the supply chain uh so that's the loss uh we have so it's a, it's a what so whatever is being produced and not consumed is a total wastage and a major chunk of that is loss in our supply chain and that is because of multiple reasons and one of the biggest reason is lack of uh, uh storage uh and if we uh if the money is being diverted in building large infrastructure uh demand supply can be smoothened out uh, uh where the supply is high you can store uh, uh when the demand is high you can uh, give back uh, uh for example uh, in current scenario uh, uh cold, if you talk about cold storage uh, um, i think maximum cold storage uh, are potato cold storage there are few for apple and carrots but uh, majority for uh, uh, potatoes i think if if we if we have a large storage ecosystem uh, near farms uh 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 then it will definitely help to curb uh, food wastage that's one and increase investment in logistics uh where you can connect 
demand market and produce market more efficiently that will also help to reduce food wastage okay 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 i'll come to you so when we talk about logistics <coughs> so you know the e-commerce logistics of course was the lowest hanging fruit that everyone has taken up some of the, there are uh, companies like revigo who built a technology and then put trucks on top of it to make it you know uh, good for the uh, you know truckers and everything so in the food space in the in the in the in the food space the uh, agriculture space what kind of what kind of solution logistical solution is really required and should come up uh, when we realize that you know we have this kind of wastage happening due to you know maybe storage facilities or other other reasons you have to unmute it so now you're on mute you have to unmute person now uh, okay yeah, yeah. so uh, you know for, for for the way i see this is that you know I, i break down logistics into two parts one is the aspect which has to do with storage and the other one is in terms of the transportation uh but now so for the storage as milan just said i think you know one one small thing that i would like to add there is also that it is not only about saying construction or adding physical capacity it is also to see how do we innovate around storage structures do we need large cold storages do we need large warehouses to be built or do we need the disaggregated flexible storage models which can be which is on demand storage because whether it is trucking transportation or storage the problem lies near the farm gate now the, at the farm gate level the unit sizes the farm sizes are small we don't know what is the kind of requirement of storage that comes in in a particular season one may build a warehouse build a build a cold storage and then sees that there are two drops back to back the whole investment goes on so the whole thing around the uh, storage pieces to try and innovate flexible storage structures something like you know you would it, it's it's like a warehouse which can be folded up and then move to another location once the use is done and i think those technologies exist in other parts of the world as a company we have, we've already brought in and used that in in a, in, a, in a few uh, geographies here and trying to now manufacture that in india itself so that is one aspect of it similarly when you come to transportation see we talk about large trucks large scale transportation but the problem that we are talking about is much much smaller scale from the farm gate to a market to say uh, earlier it was mondays i'm not saying mondays will vanish we will still have a large portion of the produce being sold through the mondi ecosystem so the requirement of transportation first starts from what do you do so that this produce which is available on the field is transported to the the the, the nearest aggregation point which could be a mandi which could be a procurement center which could be any and 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 that is where my thought is that transportation transportation solution will have to be looked at in that granular fashion as well now whether tractor trawlers can be used is there a way in which the excess trawlers that are available now tractors post harvest are mostly lying free now is there a way that could be used to transport produce is there a way to aggregate that is 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 that like the first step to overcome now once it reaches a trans, you know a storage point with say a 5000 2000 ton kind of a capacity moving it to the factory is much more simpler that's where probably a rivigo or a black buck or any other kind of a transportation mechanism can work the third point is that we also need to harness the uh, the available transportation arrangements at the local level now what we are doing is now we are trying to build a platform and as i was saying you know a lot of collaboration is something that we are currently working on where we are mapping all warehouses across the country we are mapping labor unions associated with a particular warehouse we are mapping transporters at a local level at that particular warehouse so that in at that local level you could create that ecosystem and and then build it now the moment you reach a threshold you would have many players coming in you would have a much larger formal ecosystem coming and playing that role there but it's about saying how do we make this local available infrastructure available and also more efficient okay. all right 
So, uh, uh, Sandeep, I'll come to you uh, uh, now that we spoke about all these opportunities that are uh, that are available and to do it. You know, there is one uh, there is one leading economist who I was just recently uh, listening to, and I would not name him, but he's a leading ag uh, agriculture economist, and he said that you know. Most of the agri, agri tech players who have come in or the app that they have built are just a fashionable uh, way of being a middleman. So the middleman is not actually going out, but it's just that, a, you know, instead of a dhoti gamcha or a kurta pajama, there's a person coming in, in a car and telling you things which are, you know, much, much more fashionable. And so that remains. Do you really? Uh, uh, do you think that that? Do you, uh, how do you? How do you? How, what do you? Uh, how do you see this? Yeah, you know the first thing I want to clarify is that the middleman that is there in the market today probably has, you know, better cars and better uh, sort of mobile phones than any of us in this in this thing right now. So I don't think you can classify a middleman in the agri space necessarily as a dhoti gamcha or you know that type of uh, personality. Um, so I, uh, you know, it's a very interesting point out that you bring up. Uh, I was just thinking about what uh, Prasanna was saying earlier in terms of, uh, you know, the farm gate and how, how that model will work. You know, one of the challenges that we have had, obviously, is our land holdings have become smaller. And as the land holdings become smaller, the ability for the farmer to store becomes lesser and lesser, right? The the uh, the cycle in which they work, where they are getting money for the inputs, forces them to therefore sell immediately at the output time, right? So, so now, if I am sitting there at the at the farm gate and I have to sell, who do I sell to? Right. So the challenge over here isn't just about tech; it's about finance as well. So it I think starts at the financing level. Uh, you have to be able to work with farmers in giving them the holding power to store and to be able to sell at the appropriate time. So, you know, what Prasanna is doing at Arya or what Karthik is doing at Vekul, I think in some ways goes beyond just providing technology. They have to think about how does the farmer's economics work in this process? Logistics is only one part of it, right? It's the, it's the underlying farmer economics that have to be fixed in this country. And I think that is where you know whether you come where in a in a shirt or whether you come in a car or whether you come you know in a gamcha the the whole idea is the understanding of that model and that is where the next generation entrepreneurs are coming in so the next generation entrepreneur that is coming in is thinking of the farmer as a unit producer right with the discussion that Karthik made about having you know all the people that you've heard on this on this chat have really talked about the need for improving the unit economics of the farmer. So you're thinking about the farmer as the producing unit. And till you fix that problem, you can't fix anything else. And that is the fundamental shift that you are seeing in the nature of how the interventions are happening. Is the, is the new, new age entrepreneur is thinking of the entire value chain and is saying, okay, if I just improve the farmer's economics, right? I can increase the MSP for the farmer. But if the consumer can't pay, then it doesn't work. So I have to work along this entire value chain and therefore produce something that the consumer is willing to pay more for. So it could be processed tamarind, right? Now, if I take that processed tamarind and I go all the way to making chutney with it, and the chutney sells for 10 times higher price than the tamarind, processed tamarind would have sold, and 50 times a higher price than the unprocessed tamarind, I can pay the farmer a lot more, right? So this is a ecosystem that is right now developing in the country. The government has tried, you know, food processing has been given a push multiple times for that very reason that I think everybody realizes that the solution is, is at the, at the end consumer farm economics will improve with the end consumer, but how do you tie that together? Right? So the market linkage is where the next generation entrepreneur is coming in and solving the problem. And the middleman today doesn't work that way, right? The middleman is sitting more from a financing standpoint, a procurement standpoint, rather than a changing the consumer element standpoint. So that is the fundamental shift that we are seeing as investors that today you have uh, Wintergreens that's going out and, and you know creating the next set of condiments. 
those condiments require a certain set of spices or a certain set of you know farm produce that uh, karthik will provide right and so when karthik needs to provide that quality of the farm produce he will go and work with his sort of you know people who are going the fr- fresh vegetables and that fresh vegetables guy will say okay for me to do that i need better technology and he'll come to milan and say milan can you provide me a better solution for you know being able to grade my my produce right so i think it's a it's across the system and you are seeing that ecosystem shift that we are that 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 is good for the country mm-hmm. definitely definitely so before i move to the next question i'll just uh, request our attendees again to post your questions i see a lot of them are coming in and also to our, uh, our facebook audience to post questions we'll take them up uh, in in uh, in a few minutes from now uh, I, i'll come to kunal uh, you now and uh, you know we i just heard that you know that middleman theory that uh, i bought up was especially because uh, you know it came from someone and uh but definitely are ter- uh, very uh, terrific answer that uh, sandeep gave me that it's not only the finances that we look into of the so it's the farmer first approach i would believe that is there uh, that you guys have so tell me when it comes to procuring these uh, people for uh, these produce from the farmers so what are the what are the changes that are coming up and have already come up or we can see in the future in terms of procurement which are different from what a middleman or a or a mandi person would do uh, 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 rather than you would uh, you know instead what you would do um uh, okay so i think um, yeah i think uh, what is also happening uh, uh, in agriculture is that the consumer behaviors are changing right uh, there is a there's a elite uh, consumer and their their consumption behaviors are very different uh, their requirements are also very unique now so they are asking for organic they are asking for traceable they are ask us if you go to europe they are asking for even sustainably grown products right now now given that the large large uh, base in the western world is moving towards that uh, that type of a consumption behavior there is a huge opportunity for farmers to actually adopt those practices and then create products which can then be uh, the the right fitment for those type of opportunities that exist uh, so technology again plays a very critical role uh, because what we see is uh, like you know when you have customers in europe they will go to africa because there is much more transparency and the logistics are better but if you can bring in the transparency and the trust on a technology platform that hey these are the 5000 or 500 farmers 10000 acres that we are operating in india and you can see it live every single time an activity is happening so that you know from the from the time of sowing till the time of harvesting what has happened with the crop what was the seed used what was the fertilizer used was there a pest and disease so for the end customer for the for the next for the retailer or for the, uh, the for the next intermediary who's who's buying this commodities in bulk they are assured that okay this transaction is giving me the the credit worth, uh, the worthiness in terms of coming in and engaging here so i think this is the next uh, next evolution of of uh, work that is happening uh, especially for the in the agriculture farming sector uh, that enga- enabled with a, a strong logistics warehousing other such solution would be very important uh because uh, if you see one part of the work that's happening is go for high value crops uh, which means more more of this uh, and these are high value crops which is more even perishable right so and if you can hand, if you not handle that at real time when the production is ready so in our platform what we do is we start forecasting for all of the 2.1 million farmers that you engage with uh, four weeks in advance that this is what is going to come right so the and this information is available to the supply chain players so that they know exactly in which location which farm which aggregated manner you will get what quality produce as well so that is something that you help uh, uh, the businesses to be uh, uh, so pro- proactive and predictive is very very important these days in terms of uh, supply chain management second is in terms of quality as well uh, so if you i mean when you when you have a greater quality output coming out uh, uh, a grade will cost you know if you go to a very close area in, uh, in bangalore chikbalapur you know when you see a farmer a grade and a b grade is very very like you no know, it's not very different right a small size factor but a is selling for 12 rupees whereas b is selling for 4 rupees that's the deviation in the price that happens right but with the right interventions it can increase the a grade of the productivity right now with asking the farmers to use the right practices uh, use the right uh, methods of cultivation their income substantially improves from there and then also he is able to get a larger market so i think these are the ways where we feel and we are supporting our set of farmers to maximize their income opportunity of of, of whatever area that they are operating in 
Karthik, I'll come to you before we go to questions from our uh, from our viewers. That you know, I just heard Kunal saying that you know, uh, increase uh, improving the quality of uh, produce. So, will we see uh, you know more uh, uh, more offerings from same architectures like say uh, getting a SkyMet to give uh, you know from whoever you you're procuring procuring your uh, produce, you will give weather information to them. A lot of people have issues with crop insurance. They say that it's on the paper, but they do not get it. So these kind of things, do, would we see all this come together uh, on one singular platform so that their quality, their yield, their uh, per, uh, per uh, uh, hectare uh, produce increases? And of course, the quality definitely. No, absolutely. I think uh, it's already happening. Uh, just to touch upon some of the earlier points you made, yes, if you are another app which is doing a farm to fork story, you are another middleman. I'm being as plain as that. And it doesn't work that way. Farm to fork also is not viable. Or uh, I mean, the reason I was very, very cautious talking about efficiency earlier was because, frankly, the corporate costs of a startup are not necessarily more efficient than the efficiency of a, the current supply chain. Where there is opportunities in soil to sail, uh, when you start engaging with the farmer at the beginning and giving them inputs, giving them advisory and tuning the production all along, even doing the crop planning, then there is opportunity for both the farmer and for the intermediary player to be a little more than an intermediary. Delivering uniform retail quality, for example, like uh, Punal was saying, will definitely improve the realization for the farmer. And to do that, we are already seeing a number of ag tech startups partner. Uh, we are weather stations that have uh, that have been put up for example by players uh, including us and many others which gives the farmers a simple sms saying this is what's going to happen in your area based on microclimate conditions and that in turn governs the behavior of the farm similarly the portable soil health test kits that have been set up by you know startups to make sure the farmer doesn't need to go to a krishi vigyan kendra all the way to get the test done and this information is used to design the package of practices and uh, offer this to, uh, you know, therefore offer a better yield and more uniform yield. These uh, synergies are already starting to happen and we see much more of that happening. Okay, great. Thank you, Kapi. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just start taking some of the questions that have come to us uh, on Facebook before we take questions from our uh, attendees here. So, uh, Umbi Thakar, he asked a question. Uh, my question to the panel is, why the village level entrepreneur can't be supported for storage and transportation? Because from my experience, the village community is more comfortable in connecting with the local. Uh, Milan, would you want to take that one? Right. So that can very well happen. Uh, and uh, uh, given the need and the production of a specific local area and the infusion or the support uh, uh, to promote a local entrepreneur, uh, uh, the availability of capital uh, along with identification of the need can definitely facilitate that. And it will help building the micro storage ecosystem as well. Okay. 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 Uh, I'll take another question. This is from Vitunjay Sastri. He says, do you think uh, that the existing deep rooted market committee middlemen network will allow loss of their hold on supply chain? If the resistance cannot be overcome, the reforms will become meaningless. More of an observation, but I'll come to Karthik to, uh, you know, because you said that yes, any other app will uh, remain a, a middleman only. So he says that uh, can you can you really exist in the deep rooted existing market committee middleman network? How difficult is that for you? Uh, and then I'll ask the same question to Kunal, you know, to break this and you know get the produce. No, I think it's started to happen in multiple locations already. Where three, see, ultimately any supply chain is movement of material information and money. And today all three have, uh, are, are being done a little more efficiently than they were in the past. We have much better road systems for material movement, technology for uh, information, and digital payments for money movements. So the farmer is also an entrepreneur and the farmer realizes, you know, over time, obviously there is some resistance to start with, but the farmer realizes over time which is the more efficient solution for them. And based on that, they make a choice. So yes, there are deep-rooted relationships. Yes, initially there is some challenge in breaking through. Less about, uh, especially in markets, for example, in Southern India, it's less about the hold that they have as uh, lenders and so on, but more about the comfort or uh, safety. 
but we are already seeing for example clusters like malur or kolar emerge where there are you know at least 14 or 15 collection centers which compete with the local market and the farmer actually ch- has a choice of where they want to sell so it will happen it will not happen in one fell sweep it will take its time but the markets that have these three convergences which are uh, falling in place will move fast mm-hmm. okay. uh, uh we got, uh, got a question uh, on mail uh, uh, and this is from uh, 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 someone called deepak kumar from uh, midnapur district in west bengal uh he says that we work for small and marginal farmers in remote areas our services is from soil testing to market uh, market linkage of farmer produce right now we are offering our services to more than 1000 farmer in our midnapur district uh we face uh, the difficulty of raising funds for expansion uh, you know when uh, agriculture is supported why can't agriculture be when agritech can be supported why can't agriculture be supported especially given that our farmers are not that tech savvy sandeep you want to take that one sure uh, so i think uh, you know i think that's a broader question yeah, yeah. in the in the agri investment space right now you know we are there are very few investors uh, investing in indian agri at this point i'll be very open about that we are starting to see more people starting to participate now uh, one of the challenges has always been uh, agri is a very regulated market and investors generally don't like regulated markets uh, very much right so that is that is now shifting uh, with the new models that you are seeing some of which are on this panel uh, there is an openness to 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 fund and you know i think most of the companies that are over here have raised money from from investors the key thing for you know the gentleman who has asked the question to think about is what is the path to building a large company i think everybody who is sitting here is thinking about building a business which can eventually either list on the stock exchange or can scale to be sold or whatever else right so if you are raising money uh, you have to think about what are the returns and how are the returns for the investors going to come from and that is where one area where i think it's partly a question of information but the the reason why we are having this panel with uh, with agri tech and entrepreneurs is giving information to people who are listening about what are the ways that you can think about agri tech you know all, and how can you think about scale in the in the agriculture space so you know 1000 farmers today is not a very large number a lot of the people that are on this uh, panel over here are probably dealing with you know 100 times that and there is still a, a opportunity to grow that fa- faster so my sense is that uh, if you are thinking about raising money for agriculture one of the key things is to think about uh, scale the second thing in agriculture i go back to this point is unit economics are still something that have to be sort of proven in the agriculture space where is the money who is going to pay for it and you know is there enough are there enough large profit pools here that can be captured and so that is the second area where uh, you know we are starting to see more companies emerge there but it's still uh, you know in the past most of the people that have made money in agriculture have been typically family businesses yeah you know we have more than 250 last i checked 250 agri tech players in the country if i'm not wrong but uh, you know we have very few who uh, who have made the mark so uh, i'll take another question that has come to our chat uh, and this is from uh, georgie jones uh, he asks uh, milan Uh, what do you think about uh, preservation of excess produce through quick freeze deep vacuum technology this space, think space food with the current scenario with food waste challenges such as covid 19 with regard to distribution and increasing the market partly i think you have answered the second part of the question but if you can uh, see the first part of the question what do you think about preservation of excess produce through quick uh, deep freeze vacuum technology milan yeah sorry uh, i thought i are uh, so there are multiple uh, i'll just add to few more technologies are there uh, which uh, essentially adds layer to a protective layer uh, a drying uh, 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 vacuum definitely is one uh, and and a septic packaging uh, so there are multiple ways uh, you can preserve 
uh, food product. This is on farm uh, processing as well. Uh, people do to ensure whatever is surplus is changed to more uh, uh, higher shelf life, uh, intermediary, uh, either processed or produced uh, food. And these can and but but again the co economic uh, cost and economic should make sense. Uh, what is the surplus? Where will we get that information from? Most of the produce which are generated uh, near farm gates are low in quantity, which are surplus. And how do you then move uh, uh, these systems or plants uh, or machines to ensure those are uh, cost effectively consumed? I think that's the unanswered question. Uh, wherein few startups are trying to solve that, uh, especially from the farm gate processing side. Uh, but yet the scaling of that uh, with the cost benefit analysis is yet to be seen. Okay. okay. So we'll try to take some questions from our attendees who are posted here. So uh, uh, if we can give the uh, audio to Mamta. Mamta K, she, she has a couple of questions. Okay, so my first question was actually, you know, most of the this uh, discussion ha was surrounding around the rural farmers and all, right? But then we are see also seeing a trend wherein, you know, because of uh, more promising uh, precision farming methods, uh, right? More protected horticulture and all. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, risk. Uh, uh, these uh, precision farming methods reduce the risk, actually. There is higher promise. So seeing those, a lot of corporates are entering the farming segment. So, but rural farmers are not able to embrace these farming methods. So, how do you think this is going to impact the rural farming segment actually, because of more investors and corporates uh, coming and uh, entering the agri segment? Okay. Uh, Prasanna, Kunal, you would want to take this? Yeah. So, I think that's a that's a that's right uh, 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 question as well, right now. So there is a lot of corporatization of agriculture that's happening, and there is a there is a lot of hyper precision agriculture that's that's going in and, and playing an important role. Uh, I think the need of that eventually comes from uh, the consumers themselves, which uh, are in the the urban areas and they want certain quality products products and produce uh, 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 locally sourced, supplied in in that particular time frame. So. Uh, so I think that's where the role of larger corporates are coming, and they are basically acquiring uh, uh, areas in the rural Vietnamese vicinity of those large, large uh, uh, urban clusters. We are also seeing this thing uh, in terms of like you no know, uh, different countries, like normally the Middle East. After the COVID, they have switched over their gears, and they are saying that you no, know, they now have to go into hyper precision, uh, hydroponic based uh, production within their own country because they now has to be also self reliant on on their own uh, food security aspect. So. I, I I feel that there is a huge uh, uh, focus on that side, but given the extent of the population that agriculture has to support, uh, uh, 9 9.2 billion population by around 2050, the role of all of the all of the value chains, even the smallholder farmers, uh, will be playing a very critical role. Uh, eventually, this this technologies which will be which are being done at a pilot level will get scaled up, and then this will slowly transition and smallholder farmers will also have the access in a couple of years from now. So I think these are these are great pilots. These are great stories to start off with, but eventually things will be transformed and you will see it reaching to a much larger uh, uh, base. So, Prasanna, your take, please. No, I, I agree completely, as Kunal mentioned, you know, uh, these are extremely important initiatives and we will have to keep innovating. Uh, the other thing around the, the the involvement of corporates, I think, uh, you know, uh, 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 some amount of, uh, you know, assurance around supply to them is going to be extremely critical. And I think, you know, some of these innovations bundled with the kind of assurance that many organizations that are here on this platform and elsewhere, that's that's the visibility that 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 they bring. And I think you know, that integration between the supply side and the demand side of the ecosystem is going to be extremely critical. And I think uh, what COVID has done is primarily to facilitate and sort of, you know, leapfrog uh, in, that, in that direction. So I think, you know, that is where I see this uh, moving. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, next question we will take from uh, Raghunath Ji. 
Uh, can we have uh, uh, his audio, please, Raghunath? Uh, Raghunath, uh, can you? Raghunath, can you unmute and speak? Yes, Raghunath, please go ahead with, with your question. I'll I will read out uh, his question. I think his uh, line is a little disturbed. So he says, can a massive automation can happen in Indian agriculture, like from sowing to till post harvest management and also finally supply chain? And also how to fix, optimize price fluctuations of farm, farm produce and cannot we do demand forecasting for farm producers? So, uh, I think there are two parts to the question, but uh, I will, uh, who would want to answer that? Maybe uh, uh, Karthik, you would want. Again, we're starting to see this already. Uh, uh, I'll start with the supply chain and the forecasting, and then I'll go back into the farm itself. Hmm. On uh, demand forecasting, yes, I think it's quite important that we do this because, frankly, the demand per se is less elastic. But we noticed that, you know, in our five years of existence, tomato has been one rupee at the farm gate and gone up to 100 rupees at the farm gate nine times. And that's primarily because the information that's available to the farmer on the demand is driven by arrivals in the nearest Mandi. And that's usually past information. It is not forward looking information. So the farmer basically is told the same information uh, that, the, that the intermediary tells to every other farmer. And therefore, there is over sowing, over cropping, and then everybody retreats. The cycle is there. So if true demand can be made visible to the farmer through uh, uh, smart technologies, then there is definitely value in that. For example, if sowing can be monitored real time and uh, information given to the farmer saying so many, so much acreage is already done, therefore it's almost like red, yellow or green signal on whether you should plant a particular crop or not. And that's given real time, then the farmer can take decisions. So that's one area of potential automation based uh, solution that's coming in. On supply chain, we have actually uh, observed that, uh, you know, the products themselves are fairly unwieldy. And therefore, there is a lot of human involvement in physical movement of these products, for example, in distribution centers and so on. There are beginnings of distribution center automation already for uh, uh, fresh produce, for example. Uh, COVID will accelerate that because of, uh, you know, social distancing being mandated and uh, labor unavailability being there. Definitely, there is scope for you know, automated cross-docking solutions, etc. The only challenge historically has been that these solutions are available in the West, but they operate at a very different scale. How do we scale it down uh, to enable Indian companies to step in and then gradually build scale as they go along is the real challenge that we see. On the farm end, uh, yes, we do see a lot of uh, potential over there. But uh, frankly, I am not the most qualified person to comment on it. We are already seeing a lot of uh, equipment sharing kind of solutions that have come up. And I'm sure that uh, more will come up over there as well. Okay. Sandeep, you would want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, this sort of ties back to the earlier point that was made around uh, precision farming. Uh, there is, uh, you know, I think you have to think about crops in various categories. So there are certain crops, you know, grain, for example, or pulses that are grown at scale and uh, you won't, you know, you will see mechanization there. So I will not call it automation, <laughs> but I think mechanization is uh, to Karthik's point that we are starting to see a lot more mechanization happen. You mentioned that, you know, the tractor sales at Mahindra have gone up and that's partly being driven by the fact that people are trying to become more self-reliant and not depend on, you know, labor as much, right? So I think that that, that trend is de definitely in the direction of, uh, of mechanization. Uh, a challenge obviously remains that land holdings that are small cannot necessarily afford it. So sharing is also, we're starting to see more entrepreneurs come in with sharing solutions, uh, which I think is good because it reduces the capital cost for a farmer and makes it uh, feasible. The, uh, the broader issue again goes back to, you know, the payback periods on many of these capital expenditures make it prohibitive for farmers to take that on. And that is probably one of the biggest 
reasons why you haven't seen the level of automation or mechanization come into Indian farming. So till that, you know, whether it is FPOs or whether it is some form of collectivization that happens, uh, we won't see as much uh, mechanization or automation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we've just run out of time, so we'll just take one more question before we wrap the session. So there is, uh, uh, I know it's more of uh, 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 asking for an opinion that, you know, we're talking about agriculture and uh, there is another part which I was also talking to someone is that, you know, with now people also looking at producing their own uh, food for say on, uh, you know, in urban areas and also someone wants to ask about organic far uh, farming and will agri-tech players uh, you know, uh, participate in that as well. Konan, uh, anyone, please. Yeah, so I, th <clears throat> I think these are two separate questions. Uh, consumers are, <clears throat> are also getting very uh, conscious about the food they're consuming. So the urban consumers are trying to see that, no, how can we produce it, it ourselves and then consume it locally at our own place? Uh, because they are sometimes scared about the news that is floating in social media that how food is grown. How it is uh, how it is procured, sourced, and then supplied to the to them. I think that's a, that's a fundamental. Uh, I, I think in, in some pockets, again as pilots, people are trying and exploring that. Uh, so that's that's my quick view on uh, on this particular piece. Okay. Okay. Melan, anything before we wrap up? So this is not area of my expertise, so I'll pass this one. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, but before I uh, I let all of you go, I have a question for Sandeep, uh, especially before we wrap the session. That uh, you know, till now, uh, agri tech investment was uh, you know supposed to be soft returns and everything. So, but now, do you think that uh, uh, investment in agri tech is going to uh, is not going to remain a soft investment? And uh, uh, when can we see a unicorn out of an agri tech in India? So soft by soft, I assume you mean impact investing. Yeah, exactly. So it isn't. Yeah. So I think uh, the the commercial investors, the VC funds, have started taking a lot more interest in agri uh, agri tech. Uh, I think that's the question you're asking, and that is absolutely true. And I think uh, there is, uh, you know, there are people sitting in this in this on this panel that I think are all expecting to become unicorns. So uh, I would and, want and to that and I think that will happen in two ways. So one is we are, you know, there is there is obviously a large market in India itself. But I think Kunal referred to this point earlier in his observation that India can be a, a sort of supplier to the world, right? And uh, he mentioned Europe as one example, you know, the organic point that has been brought up. So we have a company in our portfolio that is supplying globally and organic from India because Indian you know, Indian growing practices had been organic. So. So we have seen this company scale, you know, uh, rapidly because of that. So I think there is a opportunity to take in the Indian farmer and provide the market linkage. And in that process, create a large enough business that would be worth, you know, could be a unicorn, but even if it's not a unicorn, right? if it's a 200, 300, $4 million business, it is an attractive business for a, for a commercial investor. Mm -hmm. And so I expect that commercial investments would only increase in the in the Indian uh, agri space. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It was really insightful to have you all here, and I'm sure that our attendees uh, have uh, uh, you know uh, learned a lot uh, post this ses uh, session. We would love to see you again sometime uh, on our webinars, and uh, uh, you know, as all of you said, that you know, uh, collaboration and more efficient efficiency is what is required to make. Uh, uh, agriculture, uh, you know, for thrive in this country, something on which 60% uh, of the population uh, actually depends. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, so much and have a good day.